And I'm bringing a message today about trusting God completely. We first brought our first uh, sermon about uh, three uh, sermon uh, of uh, thinking like a servant. And we just got done talking about uh, loving Him supremely. And today we're going to talk about trusting Him completely. There are five points. Now I want you to get this written down, written in your heart, that we do on a daily basis. Try to do on a daily basis. Try to do weekly and monthly on a daily basis. Number one, to notice this in the book of Hebrews chapter six, that uh, we must please God, chapter, or verse six, I believe it is. Uh, Hebrews 11, six, please God. Well, how do you please God? Here are five simple steps that we learn all from and we grow to do this. God is pleased when we love him supremely God is pleased when we trust him completely God is pleased when we obey him complete with wholeheartedly wholeheartedly number four God is pleased when we praise and thank him continually and number five God is pleased when we use our abilities Psalm chapter 40, verse 4. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust. And respecteth not, nor or respecteth not his proud, but such turn away to lies. Blessed is the man that maketh the Lord his trust and respecteth not the proud and such or nor such turn as turn as us side to lies. So how do we trust God? How do we trust the Lord today? We're not supposed to trust the Lord like we trust each other. Trust is like pie crust. It's easily to be broken. It's like promises. They're easily uh, to be uh, broken. But when God turns around and he makes you a promise, he keeps that promise. Larry, has he uh, told you or said anything to you lately that he's kept? The uh, thought crossed my mind. He said that... Uh, once to me re recently about in April I'm going to turn everything around I thought it was uh, April last year I got all excited and uh, was uh, uh, excited and nothing happened I'm like what 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 then this past April what God said came to pass he didn't tell me what year he just told me April Psalm chapter 32, verse 10. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Psalms 34, 10. O taste and see of the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. I have seen many posts and I have heard people say, God is good. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. How many people have tasted of the Lord? Now you could look at something and say it's good, but until you taste it, you don't know how good it is. Now, how many people have tasted of the Lord? How many of the people are going around saying that God is good and have never tasted God? When you taste God, what does God taste like? God tastes like eternity. God tastes like forever. 
God tastes like some, something that you have never tasted before in your lifetime. We don't know how to make eternity, and we don't know how to make forever. We might think these things, but in our hearts, we don't know these things. But God is eternal, eternity, and God is forever. God is infinite. God tastes us like he's infinite, because he is infinite. There is no beginning or no end to God. So when you taste of the Lord, this is what I've discovered. I have tasted of the Lord. God is eternity. He is forever. And is, He's infinite. When I taste of the Lord, this is what I taste. I taste uh, eternity. I taste uh, forever. And I taste infinity whenever I taste of the Lord. When I open up His Bible and I read of Him. Whenever the Spirit comes and uh, talks to me, whether at work or wherever, I, that is the experience that I have. And blessed are the man that his trust is in him. When we trust in God, we trust in infinity, we trust in eternity, and we trust in forever. Psalms 84 verse 12 O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in God, in thee. Not just he says it once, but he says it here twice. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be a tree planted by the rivers of water, and that the and that spreadeth out her roots of the river and the and shall not see when heat cometh but her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought neither shall Cease from yielding fruit. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse uh, 7 and 8. Why? Because this tree is um, very deep. When mom and dad built our house back in 1983, dad and mom built a weeping willow tree, or planted, I should say, planted a weeping willow tree right next to the stream of water. Mom wanted a stream, a, a little creek bed, you know, in, in, uh, like she is, uh, raised, was raised in the South and all that, and they love creeks and everything. So Dad had them make a creek for her that ran in there so she could go down there and see this. And they planted a weeping willow tree in front of the house. And I will grant to you, after 30, 35 years, or so being uh, being there and living there that and test this fact that weeping willow tree out of all the other trees that we had planted and had planted there was and still is the strongest tree there because it was planted right next to the uh, creek bed and its roots run so deep I bet you couldn't Hardly ever get it out except with a, a crane of sort, so, some sort of getting that root out of there. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the seat, not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in the his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in its season. His leaves shall not wither and whatsoever he doth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff 
which the wind driveth away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sitteth, or nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. But the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. Psalm chapter 1 verses 1 through 6. I remember my Uncle Hubert preaching on this as a young boy many times. A young teenager especially too. On these uh, six verses. Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. I love the word hope. The second reason Noah pleased God was that he trusted God. Even when it didn't make sense, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 7, by faith Noah being warned of God of signs not seen yet as yet moved with fear prepared an ark to the saving of his house by the which he commanded the world or con he, uh, condemned the world and because and became heir to the righteousness which is by faith. Imagine this scene. One day God comes to Noah and says, I am disappointed in the human in human beings, into the entire world. Not one but you think of, about me. But Noah when I look at you I start smiling and I am pleased with your life. And I'm going to flood the earth or the world and start over with your family. I want you to build I want you to build a giant ship or an ark that will save your fam that will save you and the animals. Now, I'm going to give you a little hint. I'm going to break here. I'm going to give you a little hint. Uh, we, we move forward. And we don't think about moving backwards at all. We, we're not people that are supposed to be moving forward. But in uh, Genesis chapter 6, we read how God gave up on mankind. He just got to the point where he just gave up. You know, and what we do is we look from the time of Adam to the time of Noah at that time frame. Wherever, wherever Genesis chapter 2 began, 1 and 2 began with the creation of man till Noah's generation. But that's not how God thinks. God, God doesn't think like man. Here's how God thought when he said that. God, when God created the earth, he didn't create mankind the way we think of. We thought he created man with just, you know, started with Adam and go all the way through to the end of the world, whenever the end of the world is. No, God did not do that. God started it at the end of all things, the end of the earth, and he moved his way all the way back. It's like I always say, it's like when we... We're kids. We had this domino set. We all put dominoes. We, what we do? What we did was we didn't start at the beginning with the domino set. We started with the ending, and moved our way up back to the beginning, and then we went and started everything to go. That's why God did. God started at the end of everything. That's the reason why He knows everything. That's the reason why nothing takes Him by surprise. He already knows it because He was there. He created it to do that. When you see the mind of God and understand how God is through the Spirit of God, and it's only through the Spirit of God you can do this, then you can see who God is and 
why he is and does the things he does. So he gave up on man because he's seen what from the begin from the ending all the way up to Noah's generation, from all the times that he was rejected, all the times that he was uh, barred out, all the time he he seen Jesus in the in the book of Revelation, chapter two through four, two uh, chapter two and three, where he started in the center of the church, and in the Laodicean church, he at the last church, he's out there knocking at the door. Can I come in? I, you know, can I come in? He's seen all of this. So it's easy for me to see why he gave up on man. When you look at it in that scenario. There was a problem. First, Noah had never seen rain. Because prior to the flood, God irrigated the earth from the ground up. And every plant in the field before the earth, before it was in the earth, and every herb in the field became it, grew. For the Lord God had not caused the rain, caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no man to tilt the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Genesis chapter 2 verse 5 and 6. We I don't know why we think the way we think. We think uh, man started in Gen Genesis chapter 3 when he fell. Everything, everybody wants to pick, uh, pick that up where he, and we never this, uh, we never read Genesis chapter 2 and the beginning of Gen Genesis 3 thinking to ourselves this is the way it was before the fall. This is the way it was. And I've come to learn to do this within myself and there's a lot in Genesis chapter 2 that we overlook. That we don't see. There's a lot in the first part of Genesis chapter 3 that we overlook and we don't see because Everybody was stuck from the fall all the way through. Adam fell. Well, what happened before Adam fell? What, ha what happened to Adam and Eve? They ain't much in there, so they ain't much to tell. Well, it's important. Secondly, Noah lived a hundred, hundreds of miles from the nearest ocean. Even if he could build a ship. How would he get it to water? Thirdly, there was a problem of routing all the, rounding up all the animals and then caring for them. But Noah didn't complain or make excuses or tried to figure it out. He trusted God and completely he trusted God completely, and that pleased God. Now, Noah, Noah this. He didn't complain about it. I work with a bunch of complainers. All they do is complain, complain, complain. Nothing is going right. Well, they don't have enough sense to make it right, for one. Oh, it's not my job. Well, if it's not your job, why are you complaining about it then? Or make excuses, you know. I can't do this because I'm busy doing this and I want to do this and I'm doing this and then, then you're messing me up. Or try to figure it out now. This is the, the, the great one. We try to figure God out. Oh, what's God doing? Let's see if we can find... And mankind is always trying to figure out God. And they're, and they're always trying to, you know, in a war, we're trying to figure out the enemy, what the enemy is up to so that we can around and stop them and whatever his ways are so beyond our ways trusting God completely means having faith that he knows what is best for your life you expect him to keep his promises help you with your with problems and do the impossible when necessary. The Bible says the Lord is
takes pleasure in them that fear him and that in those that are that hope in his mercy psalms 147 verse 11 these psalms were written to us by david out of his experiences with the lord proverbs was written by solomon by his experiences with the lord it took Noah a hundred years, 120 years to build the ark. Imagine his face many discouragement, many discouraging days with no sign of rain year after year. He was ruthlessly criticized as a crazy man who thinks God speaks to him. Imagine Noah's children when often embarrassed by the giant ship that there were in the front yard. Yet Noah kept trusting God. In what areas of life, of your life, do you need to trust God completely? Trusting God is an act of worship. Just as parents are pleased when children trust their love and wisdom, your Faith makes you happy. The Bible says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That is Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. And in closing, Abraham believed God and did not stagger at the promises of God be, believe that God was able to do everything that he had promised. He was able to perform. God did not come into the kind of faith until he was 99 years old. Sarah, his wife, being his half-sister, they had, uh, they had uh, problems trying to uh, figure things out. Everybody was having uh, babies and seeing the kids grow up, having grandbabies. Here they are, they couldn't get to first base. They wondered what was happening. Then around uh, 75 years old, God made a promise to Noah, or uh, to Abraham. God made a promise here to Abraham that he's going to have a seed. And his seed is going to be uh, abundant of nations and uh, all that. So he uh, turned out and had faith about it. But when God makes us a promise, we expect him to keep his promise and deliver it right then. Or in the next 12 hours. Or 24 hours. Waiting on God is not an option. When we, well, way we think. We think he made a promise. Okay it's going to come. Right, uh, right in a few seconds. Or right in a few minutes. Or right in a day or two. But God didn't do this to Abraham. And he doesn't do that to us. When God makes us a promise. He doesn't uh, just tell us exactly when. He gives us a promise. And he causes us hope on it. They didn't see a child. So what Abraham did, he said, okay, fine, you know, uh, what What do we, uh, what to do? Did they, Sarah uh, said, okay, i tell you what we'll do. We'll make Hagar uh, do that. Uh, Hagar will, uh, my uh, oldest servant here, she will uh, do that. And Abraham said, sounds like the will of God for me. And he goes into the Hagar's tent. They conceive an Ishmael. A child. When he gets 13 years old, Abraham goes up to God and says, Let this child, Ishmael, be the promised child that you uh, desired for us. And God says, No, that's not going to happen. He said, My covenant was with you and Sarah, not with you and somebody else. No, 
I will take him and I will uh, multiply his seed and everything, yes. But my covenant is strictly for you and your wife, period. So he sent Ishmael away, and that's a very long story. He didn't do. Ishmael, technically, he left with his mother, and he married, and he had 12 children, 12 sons, and there were tw the uh, 12 Ishmaelites, who technically are Muslims, or come from the Muslim race, the Muslim family. The Muslims and the Jews are half-brothers, and they are at war with each other over the earth, uh, over... Uh, over uh, each other and set out the Muslims want to destroy everything of Christians that has come from he, uh, the Israel and um, they have a holy war going on have been for centuries and centuries and centuries and it all started with Ishmael and Isaac and Ishmael hating Isaac because Ishmael getting, uh, not getting the promise, but uh, Isaac getting the promise. Faith comes through testing and trials. Abraham was called the friend of God because of the test of trials he went through with. Faith not only comes out of the fire, and it also comes out of the flood. Sometimes in the New Testament, Luke chapter 1, Sarah or Zechariah, the high priest, had the same issue. And he couldn't bear children. And when he went into the Holy of Holies and did his final act, where he retired after that from being a priest, a messenger was sent. And his name was Gabriel. No, Gabriel was not an archangel. There's only one archangel, and that's Michael. So he was a messenger. Gabriel was a messenger, and he came to uh, Samuel, or uh, Zechariah, and he appeared to him, and he said to him that he's going to have a son, he's going to name him John, and he's going to be the forerunner of the Savior, of Jesus, the Messiah. Zechariah refused to believe him, and he said, okay, show me a sign. If you, if all this is true, show, show me a sign. And Gabriel's like, show you a sign? I'm Gabriel. I'm here. I'm the angel. You want a sign? This is the sign. I'm the sign. You, show me a sign. I'm the sign. So he said, okay, fine. Since you don't receive me as the sign and all this, you're going to be deaf and or you're going to be dumb and blind. You won't be, or you're not going to be able to say, say anything. You, well, uh, dumb, he said. Not blind or deaf or anything. But you, you ain't going to be able to speak anything until the baby is born. You want a sign. This is your sign, then. Mark chapter 9, the Father and the Son. Jesus, how long has and Jared Jairus, I uh, love that story of Jairus and his daughter and she's sick, she's going to die and he goes to Jesus and asks Jesus to heal her and he goes to heal her and the servants of Jairus comes to him, says, Trouble not the master no more. She is dead. Jesus pulls up to the sign and says, Okay, now, you got two reports. Theirs are mine. What are you going to believe? Their report, she's dead. 
or mine that I can raise her from the dead. Your choice. Jairus looks at Jesus and says, come on. Let's go. I believe your report. I'll close with this. In this generation, in the Luke chapter 16, it talks about the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man fell sumptuously every day, had everything that he could ever want, the Lazarus, and Lazarus was a beggar. He laid about outside of uh, the rich man's gate, desiring the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table to eat. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. The two men had one thing in common. They both died. How they died and ended up was, a, was about the... Uh, on kind of each other's lives. The rich man woke up in hell, burning and suffering and torment. Lazarus was in the bosom of Abraham. And Jesus tells the tale, and the last part of this is what I'm getting at. He says, There's no hope, basically, no hope for me, but I have five brethren. Let them uh, hear him. Let the Lazarus go up and uh, talk to them. And he said, and Abraham looked at them and said, no. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if one rose from the dead. Here the prophets of the Lord are still prophesying. We're all preaching. We're all teaching. And if you won't believe us, then why don't you believe the messenger, the one that Jesus, about Jesus, him being rose from the dead. Jesus rose and conquered death, hell and the grave for our sakes. But the worldly system, the world over all nations refuse this teaching. And if they refuse one that is written from the grave, him, Jesus, then they won't believe any others as well.